Okay, this uh, lecture is about uh, nonlinear first order partial differential equations. Uh, so we're, we're going to be dealing with those, and it's a bit of a crowded set of lecture notes, unusual, uh, because I made them a long time ago. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about specifically in the nonlinear problems. Uh, of this type, where I have a time derivative of some, some function, uh, for example, height of a, height of a wave, uh, or, um, or concentration of something in, in a flow. Uh, so this is a time derivative of u, uh, and a convective term, a spatial derivative of u. And then we've got a function sitting out front, and this is where the nonlinearity is coming from. In the problems that we did before, uh, the term right here, was a uh, constant coordinate, a constant u-independent velocity. Uh, but uh, here we have uh, a velocity that depends on uh, the solution of the problem. So the nonlinearity is sitting in this part of the equation. And we're going to consider the special case uh, where this h of u term is actually equal to 0. And in that case, this problem looks like some kind of a conservation equation. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's going to turn out that we can actually solve these problems in the special case where we get rid of this term. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is to really just try the method that we used in lecture three, uh, and that is to expand the total derivative in some new variable tau, uh, equate the coefficients of the partial derivatives, so this, is, this is the method of characteristics that we're using, uh, and, and then solve the resulting ODEs that come out of this. And that will give us constants that depend on our choice uh, of uh, the initial condition. And uh, then in the final step, we force the old coordinates, that is the x and the t coordinates, to match the q and the tau coordinates, the, the new coordinate system of characteristic coordinates, at the initial, uh, at the initial time. Uh, OK, so, so that's basically the idea. Uh, remember, this is the, the PDE that we want to solve, u sub t plus g of u, uh, u sub x equals 0, okay? So if we do the first step, du d tau, uh, expand that in partial derivatives, uh, multiply it by the, the rate of change of t with respect to tau and x with respect to tau, then we can recognize that for the uh, group of first order derivative terms in our PDE, that's this, uh, to be equal to the thing on the right-hand side of this total derivative, I have to choose that d tau, d, dt d tau equals 1, and dx d tau is g of u. Okay, so if I make those two choices, then uh, we find uh, that dt d tau gives me, quite trivially from integration, t equals tau uh, plus some constant that can be a function of the new coordinate q. Uh, but here we get stuck. Right, so we have the dx d tau is uh, g, uh, which depends on u, which depends on t and q, and so there's no way we can do this integration uh, directly. Uh, but because of the special case where h of u is equal to zero in this problem, uh, we can look and take some inspiration from our answer uh, back when we did this for linear partial, uh, first order partial differential equations. And there we had u sub t plus some constant velocity times u sub x. And we found that the solutions were u is some function of uh, x minus vt, right? So this function phi is something that we get from the initial conditions. Okay, so recognizing that v and g of u are analogous quantities in this problem, uh, we're going to see whether, whether this kind of solution could actually could actually work in this problem. And so the usual strategy in differential equations, we're going to guess a solution like this. We're going to plug this back into, compute the partial derivatives and plug them back into the PDE and see whether indeed this is a solution. So this is going to require implicit differentiation. And uh, we compute u sub, uh, the partial derivative of u with respect to time. Uh, if, it's a, if it's this function phi of this grouped variable, it's going to be phi prime uh, with that argument multiplied by the derivative of the argument with respect to time. And that's kind of a complicated thing. So, of course, the x uh, term vanishes uh, when I take its derivative with respect to time. But the t term, uh, we, get, uh, we get t times the derivative of g, which is a function of u. So I get g prime of u multiplied by the derivative of u with respect to time. And then I also have a term here that is g multiplied by the derivative of t with respect to t, which is just 1. OK, so that's what's in here in this curly bracket term, is the derivative of x minus g of t, x minus g times t, uh, with respect to t. And we can simplify that slightly into uh, this format over here. 
Okay, so just dropping all the arguments. Remember that they are there, but I'm dropping them. Okay, then uh, I go through and I compute the partial derivative of u with respect to x in much the same fashion. The only difference is that we're now differentiating this argument of phi with respect to x uh, instead of with respect to t. So we get a 1 from the x minus t g prime of u times the derivative of u with respect to x. And that one simplifies to this. Okay, so now we have to substitute these two uh, things into the partial differential equation. And we get that ut plus g of u times u of x is, after some algebra, minus t g prime of u phi prime of the argument x minus g of u t multiplied by ut g of u u of x, u sub x. Okay, so notice that this guy and this guy are the same. And now we can simplify this a little bit. We could say that this is true if and only if this equation is true, right? So, so what we have here is that, that the, the combination of first order partial derivatives that was in our original problem, u sub t plus g of u, u, u sub x, multiplied by this complicated coefficient, uh, must be equal to zero, okay? Well, we didn't say anything about the nature of phi uh, that appears here inside this thing, right? Uh, we could have picked any phi, and this equation would have resulted, a necessary consequence of choosing a solution of the form phi of x minus g times t, okay? So that means that this would, this would be true for any phi that we chose. Take, for example, phi equals one. This whole term vanishes now, and you find that this thing must be zero, right? And, and that's true. That must then be true for, for whatever phi uh, we choose. So, so basically, we have confirmed that the, the, the trial solution that we, we guessed, this guy, is indeed a solution of the problem. Uh, so the, the problem is that this is not a very practical solution, right? So this is a uh, implicit definition of the function u of x and t in terms of some other function phi uh, whose argument is u, includes u. Okay, so it's not a very, not a very practical solution in that sense. And uh, we, can, we can actually go through here though and, and find that, that there are things that we can say about this problem and, uh, and figure out what the solutions will do. Uh, so, so instead of defining a new set of coordinates, tau and q, what we're gonna do is instead think about uh, remember that, that tau and q represented uh, the prop tau represented the propagation through some new kind of time uh, of the initial data, and the q represented uh, a set of a set of coordinates along which the original the original uh, initial condition did not did not change. Right. So uh, so what we're going to do here is to just think: what if we could find x of t? So we have the original coordinates are in the x, t plane. And what if we could find some parameterized curve, x of t, that would start on the initial, on the initial axis. I didn't draw that very well. That point is supposed to be along this axis. Uh, and it's going to propagate the initial conditions through time in a way that will maintain the value of u constant, OK? And, and then we, if we could find the, those curves, x of t, then we would know the characteristics and we would be able to construct solutions from them, okay? So let's expand the total derivative of u in terms of t, which is gonna depend, as we move along one of these characteristic curves, is gonna depend on the rate at which u is changing with x and the rate at which x is changing with t, uh, added to the rate at which u is changing in time explicitly, multiplied by the uh, rate of change of t with t, which of course is just one. Uh, okay, so if we, if we now look at the structure of our solution, and recognize that this dx dt uh, should be the velocity in the problem, that g of u term. Uh, now the chain rule gives us that this du dt has to be, uh, this g of u is now the coefficient in here. So now our chain rule is going to give us this. So du dt is u sub x g of u plus u sub t. Now that's the, the combination of terms again. This is the thing that we were uh, that we were hoping to isolate, right? So, so this thing must be zero according to the partial differential equation. If we choose u to have the form phi of x minus g 
of u times t, then this whole thing must be 0. Okay, so that means that the curves uh, that satisfy this equation, dx dt, dx dt equals g of u, are also the curves along which the solutions of u of x and t uh, are constant. That is to say, if you move along these special curves, it's a very different situation from the one that I drew here. Instead, uh, the value of u is not changing as you move along these special curves that have this property at every point along them. Okay, so these are the characteristics. And let me try and sort of sketch for you what that might look like. Uh, of course, I did this sketch ahead of time. Uh, but uh, we have the x-coordinate, we have the t-coordinate, and we have these isosurfaces, right? So these are x of t given some initial point along the x-axis, which I've labeled c1 in this, for this curve, and x of t given initial condition c2, uh, along this curve and you know some C3, C4, C5, every point along this axis gives rise to a new curve propagating forward in time uh, that tells me how I should move through the X and T space so that the function U does not change as I as I follow that curve. Okay so uh, the problem is that we can we can see uh, when we look at the equations that there's something wrong with the way I drew this picture. Okay, and what is that? If this is true, that the d dx dt is equal to g of u, then I can go through and I can compute a second derivative of x with respect to time, and that would tell me something about the curvature of, of the characteristic in the xt plane. That is, you know, is it a straight line? Is it a curve? Uh, what is it doing? That information is in the second derivative of x versus t. So, so that second derivative, based on this equation up here, must just be the first derivative with time of g of u, and that would be g prime of u times du dt. But we know that as we move along these curves, uh, because of the way we define things, that du dt has to be equal to 0. Okay, so let's look at that carefully. This guy, by the way we've, by the way we've defined this function u, and the way we've defined uh, the, the curves, x of t, this has to vanish, okay? So that says that the x versus t must be a straight line to give me a second derivative that's zero. So the curves x of t, given some initial point along the x-axis, are straight. And now we know the nature of our curves, and we know that the initial slope, which is going to be maintained for forever, uh, until something catastrophic happens uh, that I'll tell you about soon, um, is going to be given by the value of the initial condition in the problem. Okay, So dx dt is dx dt at the initial time, uh, which is just g of u uh, evaluated at the initial point along the x-axis and at the initial time. Okay, So let's see if we can imagine what this construction looks like. Uh, it says, really, that the characteristic passing through this point along the x-axis at the initial time has a slope uh, given by uh, g of u at x0 and 0, which we can extract from the initial conditions. If I know u of x0 and 0 and I know the function g, I can calculate the slope by computing this. And so, for every point, uh, for every point along my uh, x-axis here, I get one of these little dotted lines that represents a characteristic curve, x of t. Okay, And if, if the function in the initial condition, here, here you see the, the function u of x0, uh, this first Gaussian peak here, is almost 0 at this point. So the dotted line is almost parallel to the t-axis. right? Uh, that is to say, dx dt is about 0, uh, given by the, the value of u here. As I move along the thing, the, func the initial condition starts to get bigger, and that is reflected in the slope, dx dt getting bigger, and then eventually they start to come back down. By the time I get over to here, I've got lines that are parallel to the t-axis again. Okay, so if I now if I now use this idea uh, that if I march forward in time to a new uh, t equals delta t. Uh, contour right here, and I ask what is the solution doing there? Well, the solution doesn't change along the characteristics, 
So it must still be zero along this dotted line. It must have to, driv, risen to about half of the maximum along this dotted line, which says it's about here. And right here at the maximum, well, the maximum has moved ahead now uh, to this point. And as it comes back down, you see that there's a, so this was a rarefaction over here. This part is, is getting spread out. And as I move to the, to the right side of the peak, you see things are getting compressed together, okay? So, you know, it goes from its maximum now to basically zero uh, right along this line, which now at this point are very close together. And if I follow that all the way up to the point where these, where these characteristics are, are intersecting each other out to here, then what you see is something that looks like a cresting wave. Right, so this is a this is a shock wave formation. Uh, this has uh, rarefied on this side uh, significantly, and now it is just precipitously dropping off on the on the front face of this wave, and uh, that's causing um, the uh, that that's basically you know if you want to see this happen, you can go to the beach and see that because uh, if you look at one of these differential equations that describes, for example, waves. Uh, you have, let me go back to the very, very beginning, uh, something like this, a PDE to describe waves, would have uh, the, uh, the, the local, what is the height of the wave doing, you have the uh, traveling velocity of the wave, which depends on the depth of the wave at any given point in time. And if points where the wave is deeper, that is where it's higher uh, above the sand, uh, are traveling faster, then what this ends up predicting is that the uh, so that is to say that you're dealing with a case where g is a monotonically increasing function of u, uh, then, then what that would predict is that these things will travel until the crest of the wave catches up with the trough of the wave, and then the wave breaks. And beyond this point, we cannot use the method of characteristics anymore. Uh, it becomes completely invalid. Uh, but at least you can use this to kind of understand why the, why the wave breaks and uh, and uh, of course, I suppose that that's somewhat relevant at UCSB.